I found for a crack filling, thick set works a lot better because it's pretty vis viscous. It flows really nicely. So we're gonna mix some of this up to get in there. And if I knew where my kitchen scale was, I'd be using that. Um, let's see, we got eight ounces, which is a little more, call that nine. So we need about three ounces of this. Hmm. This is gonna be a little bit of a guesstimate. I don't like that. Okay, took a pause, found a smaller cup that's got better measurements. Hopefully I've got enough hardener here. But yes, the thick set is gonna flow into the cracks a lot better. We're going to tint it with some black that'll look really nice as I expected that. Ran out a little early. So as you noticed, we taped the underside of the table to keep the epoxy inside of it. And then on the ends, I've learned that tape doesn't hold on the ends worth anything. So that's where we use some caulk and caulked that in and that'll hold it. Um, then you see, I like even just smeared some. That's not a big deal because this hasn't been flush cut yet. All that's gonna get trimmed up. So I'd rather do the messy work before everything gets trimmed and then we'll have nice clean edges. And now just time to mix forever. Epoxy's all sanded down. It's looking really good. Next is to build the mold for the concrete, do that. But before we can do that, we need to square off the ends and because ultimately this is gonna be mostly a rectangle. So we need some reference points. Of course, nothing on this is straight. So we've established a straight edge. I've got this uh, handy eighth inch piece of eight foot long aluminum that I use all the time for stuff like this. This was like eight bucks or something, well worth having in the shop. And this is going to be the straight line. I just based it roughly on how this edge is since this edge is pretty straight. And now, got a big framing square and we can tie these together to then mark where we're gonna flush cut the ends to length. Form is starting to come together. We have it rough set. We ended up adding some steel underneath the melamine because we saw that with the span between the sawhorses, it was sagging just a little bit. And then that rem reminded me of when I did the five epoxy river tables up in Lexington for the brewery and we didn't add any support under the melamine and had, had issues keeping things straight. So we cut some steel, put that under there. That's gonna help keep everything nice and stable. Um, we have this edge 44 inches from the line so we can do some measurements to start cutting the rebar and then we'll have to put this back in place because we'll have to slide this out to get the rebar set. But yeah, could also use remesh, but I have rebar, so we're gonna use some rebar.
since I'm using rebar, I've got to tie it together. So I got some rebar ties um, that I'm twisting with pliers because I don't know where my little wire tie spinny deal went, but gets the job done just the same. Just finished cleaning out the mold really well, vacuumed it, blew it out with air, wiped it down with denatured alcohol, did all that again. Um, so I don't have a wide enough sheet of melamine, so I use two ones for the mold, but then to make sure everything's not a wonky, I've got another sheet on the other side. Don't know if I mentioned that, but that's what's keeping everything level. Also check this with a level. We're all level. Rebar is tied. All the total boat four minute epoxy that I used to hold the rebar in is set. So ready to do the scary part, make some concrete and it in here. So one thing about this countertop mix is that it's very picky about how much water you use. You have to be very consistent. So got some water buckets, got a measuring bucket. This is also being tinted. So I've just got some generic uh, sack concrete, concrete tint. And the nice thing about being consistent with the water is then I can be consistent with measuring out my pigment. So everything is the same color. Add the pigment to the water to make sure it's thoroughly mixed because if you just mixed it in with the uh, dry mix, might not be able to get it thorough and we don't want this streaky. So it's going in the water, um, add the water, add the powder, mix it up, pour it. So gonna get to that. Just took the plastic off. This has a 24 hour demold time. We ended up letting it sit another day cause it was kinda, kinda late in the day when we finished pouring it. So time to take this thing out of the mold and here's hoping I didn't ruin a thousand dollar walnut slab. Really happy with the way this looks. Um, next up though is just working on the transition line. I'm trying to decide how I want to tackle that, but of uh, the options I'm debating, I need to do a grain feeler and some kind of sealer on this wood. Really should have pre-finished the wood before we did the slab, but uh, just a little preoccupied with the whole shop build out. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna get this sanded up and get the grain filler on there while I decide exactly how we're gonna handle this transition. Using my go-to finish, Total Boat Halcyon, I'm going to do the first coats with the Rugged Amber Gloss to warm and tone the wood. Um, for the longest time, this was only available in a gloss, which is the purest form of any finish. Last year, they actually started adding a, they added a satin in clear. So I'll build everything in gloss because that's the clearest finish and then I'll top coat with the satin to uh, knock down the sheen some. It's gonna look really nice. I like to spray it, sprays nice and 
water cleanup. I really try to avoid anything that you need to use solvents. It's just such a nightmare. Not to mention environment and stuff. But yeah, we'll get the uh, Fuji all set up, then we'll spray. The wood on the top of the table is looking great. After the gloss amber, sanded this down to 400 with the Merca system. Love the new car on that, by the way. And then sprayed the Halcyon satin. It looks awesome. Didn't record that because, you know, it all kind of looks the same. Remove the masking, and now I'm about to do the finish on the concrete. Got this stuff off Amazon. You're supposed to use a microfiber pad. I don't have any, and it's the whole, like, 2021 winter vortex storm whatever we're calling it right now so uh, gonna use some cloths wipe this on apparently rub it on one way let it sit an hour then rub it perpendicular um, with another layer so give that a try oh and um, before I did the finishing I also did sand this at uh, 400 with the iridium paper on the Merca and that really really smooth things out feels good looks good it's gonna look better So did the two coats, one long ways, then I let it dry about an hour and did it the other way. One thing I noticed though, is that it streaked really bad and this is really glossy. So those streaks really show up. I don't like that, but I did some experimenting in a non-woven pad, these little scotch bright, it's not really a scotch bright though, pads do great at knocking down that streaking and take it from a gloss to a satin, which also matches the Halcyon. See over here in this corner, that's my experiment where it worked. So I'll show you what I'm talking about and uh, how I fixed it. Time to work on the base, which is all steel. So coming outside, cause I'm gonna weld out here anyway. So may as well cut it all out here. So the base is gonna be a trapezoid, as you probably saw in the thumbnail. So I cut the tops and I cut all the uh, four sides because they're gonna be the same. Um, I have a model, but just because I'm working with angles and I probably didn't exactly match my the angle I drafted, I like to set it up and now I can measure for my last piece to make sure it does actually fit and that's just gonna make everything come together better. So here's the way the bases come together. I think I showed you this outside. I don't remember, it's a few days later. But anyway, there's something I need to check that I realized. So before we build this up, we're gonna jump back in time on the table. It's not actually finished yet because you can see the bottom of this base is actually fa fairly narrow. It's um, 25 inches. It's actually shooting for 26, by the way, 25 inches. So with all the concrete on the table, there could be an issue with it throwing off the center of gravity. Normally on a tabletop, the natural center of gravity on the table is gonna be in the middle because all the material is the same. Concrete is a lot denser than wood, or, and especially walnut. So having all that concrete on just one side, we need to find the center of gravity on the table and make sure that the center of gravity is gonna stay over this base, even if someone's on one side of it pushing on it or something. The way we did that, we have a 90 inch table, Took a 10 foot stick of EMT, cause we have a bunch of EMT. I haven't taken the extra from doing all the electrical back yet. And we found the place where you can see that this table is almost weightless right now. It almost balances, it bounces very lightly. So where this EMT is, is very close to the center of gravity and it's actually favoring the wood side, which means the center of gravity of the EMT is actually closer to the middle. It's on this side of the EMT, not that side of the EMT. 
So 44 inches, I can come into 22. This is my center. And because my base is 25 inches wide at the bottom, I basically have a 12 and a half inch window on either side. And according to this, my center of gravity is five inches off from the center of the table. The edge of the base on the bottom, not on the top, but on the bottom, which is where it counts, is actually going to be still a good seven inches past the center of gravity. So even if someone's pushing, lean in, whatever on this, we've got plenty of support. I don't think it's going to be a problem. But haven't done this much concrete lopsided on a slab before, so just wanted to check if you do mixed media or you're mixing material where there might be a weight issue. It's really, really easy to check center of gravity. You just need something long enough that you can balance on. Me and Robbie just kept playing with it. And you can see that even just with a, a pinky, I can just bump this and make it rock. Trust me, without that fulcrum, this is stupid heavy, probably four or 500 pounds easy. Now that we verified with the center of gravity that these bases are gonna work, it's time to weld it up. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the super cool fireball square stuff that you can change the angle to. So I'm using these just to keep everything on the same plane. And then I've got a piece of just sheet metal underneath to help protect my floor from spatter. And I'm just going to have to do this kind of old school, do some tack welds to hold it together. Then I'll check that it's square, which is really that the top and bottom are parallel with each other. And once we have that, then, uh, you know, do the full beads. And when I weld this, because it's furniture, I want it to look good. I'm going to just weld on the outside. Inside corners are crazy hard to smooth out those welds and my welds aren't anything anyone wants to look at. So I'll just do the outsides, maybe the tops where we can grind it because uh, I don't want to weld somewhere that I can't grind and make look good. Now we're going to uh, make me look like I know how to weld because we know how to video, but I don't know how to weld. So cool montage, hopefully. I've already marked the locations of where those tabs are gonna be on the bottom of the top. Now to attach the table, instead of using screws, I like to use threaded inserts and then bolts. The thing with these threaded inserts I was able to get is they're tapered quite heavily. If I used a bit that was, you know, size for kind of in between, it would be way too small for the top. If I use a bit sized for the top, then there's gonna be zero engagement on the threads on the bottom of this. So I marked one to go full depth, that's a small one, and then a partial depth that'll over drill for the top. So I'll have sort of a, a stepped hole since I don't have a tapered bit. Hope that makes sense. If not, then it doesn't. These little dudes have a hex cut in them, so you can put a uh, hex key, Allen key, whatever you want to call it, in there and try to drive it. But in my experience, they strip out really easy. So I like to take one of the bolts and double, double nut it. That comes into account later in being able to get it off easy and use this to drive it instead.
I had to torque it pretty hard to get it all the way in there. But the deal with the double nut is that makes it really easy when I turn around and back it out, my bolt isn't wedged tight in those threads and it doesn't want to break free. The uh, double nut I'm pushing using these nuts to drive it in instead of being set against the head. I'm sure you've all had that experience sometimes where you have a nut and bolt and then you get it locked and try to back it out and the bolt is in the insert so tight instead of the bolt coming out of the insert, the insert just comes out of the wood. Doing a double nut first helps prevent that. I'm really excited to have this one wrapped up. It was very challenging. You can see it in a second, but anyway, I hope you learned something, were inspired or at least entertained. And until next time, make time to make something. Really good at mixing stuff. Mm, thank you. Lots of experience. Like the woodworking thing just doesn't take off and you don't become like the big superstar on YouTube. You could just change to a cooking channel and absolutely wow everybody with gourmet homemade pizzas.